Hello, my name is Marion Fourcade. Uh, I am uh, the director of UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix. And I am delighted to welcome you today uh, and especially to host Joan Donovan for her lecture, The True Cost of Misinformation, Producing Moral and Technical Order in a Time of Pandemonium. Uh, today's program is the second of four events happening this spring semester, which are related to an ongoing research project titled Solidarity and Strife, Democracies in a Time of Pandemic. This is a project that was co-developed by um, UC Berkeley's D-Lab and also the Social Science Matrix and is generously funded by the Social Science Research Council. <clears throat> the project studies how social media and the data collected from it can be used to understand the dialectics of divisiveness, divisiveness and togetherness that are shaping political polarization in the United States. And also you, you, we're looking at the UK. So we want to express our gratitude to the SSRC for making today's event uh, possible. Now in March, uh, in the same series, we will be welcoming Evgeny Morozov, who uh, you may know, who has written extensively on the political and social implications of technology. And he will offer his own reflections, partly from the book he is currently finishing, uh, titled Freedom as a Service. Uh, the, the talk title is uh, Beyond Competition, Alternative Discovery Procedures and the Post-Capitalist Public Sphere. Um, and finally, I'd like to briefly uh, mention that Social Science Matrix has many other public events lined up for this spring. Uh, uh, also through the UC Berkeley uh, Democracy Town Hall series, uh, as well as through the uh, Matrix on Point series and our author meets critic um, book series. So you can, for more details about all of this um, and all, you know, all our forthcoming events, you can uh, sign up uh, for a Matrix uh, newsletter. And you have, um, we have a link here on the, on the slide and maybe we can add a link also in the chat window. Now, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our guest today. Here she is. Uh, Joan Donovan is the research director of the Shore Science Center, uh, a, a research director at the Shore Science Center on Media Politics and Public Policy. She received her PhD in Sociology and Science Studies from the UC, uh, from the University of California, San Diego. And she was also a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the UCLA Institute for Genet Society and Genetics. Joan probably does not know this, but the first time I heard her, she was giving a fabulous presentation on, at, at the American Sociological Association meetings on a white supremacist use of DNA ancestry tests. And today she leads the field in examining uh, internet and technology studies, uh, online extremism, media manipulation and disinformation campaigns. She directs the technology and social change project at the Shore Science Center. Uh, which is a project that examines how media man manipulation is a means to control public uh, conversation, derail democracy, and disrupt society. Um, and finally, her work has been uh, showcased in a wide array of media outlets, including NPR, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, and more. So Joan will speak uh, for about 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, and then uh, we will open uh, for questions, which I will moderate. So uh, uh, you cannot hear the thunderous applause, Joan, but uh, we are very excited to have you. Uh, well, and now you. it's up to you. I appreciate that. And thank you for having me. I figured I'd, I'd swap outfits and get a little cozy uh, uh, for a cow, you know, just wear, wear a nice gray hoodie, fit into the to the to the mood of today um i gotta warn people i'm a little angry this week about some of the stuff that's going on and uh the shenanigans over in australia the kind of legacy media wars proxy wars being fought through uh politicians journalists journalism hangs in the balance um here uh and then those that are big enough to get paid off like news corp do and the rest of media uh, is kind of left fighting for scraps. But Facebook did turn off the news <laughs> in Australia. So if you were like, oh no, like should they take Trump off the platform? This is different, right? 
Um, and so uh, happy to discuss things of that nature and the implications of it, of course, um, in the discussion as we go along here. Um, and also happy to discuss things about the field of media manipulation, disinformation, uh, and our very unique approach that we take over at Shornstein related to these topics. I am a sociologist and an ethnographer uh, by trade. And so uh, one of the things that we really try to help people understand is that you don't need, uh, um, you know, ad an advanced degree in data science, although sometimes it's nice, uh, to do this kind of work. What you really need is uh, a, a mind for sniffing out the BS. You really need to try to figure out what kind of power is at play, who is being manipulated, what kind of content is being used. And then, of course, um, as the sociologist, the question for me is always who is being harmed? What kind of social institution is, is in the crosshairs uh, of um, misinformation at scale at this the, this iteration of my research at least looks at that. But, um, uh, you know, I began this looking at white supremacist networks online, looking at how they talked about science. And so we're going to return to some of those themes today as well to think about the implications on science for misinformation at scale um, and a whole host of other things. So today's presentation is a very generic title because I kind of never know what I'm going to talk about because I never know what's going to be happening week to week uh, related to mis and disinformation. So I'm going to try to keep it fairly contemporary with some uh, examples. And and uh, as we get rolling along here, I'll see if I can actually open the chat. Yeah. All right. Computer's working. That's good. Um, so yeah, if there's anything that like needs immediate clarification in the chat, um, I, I can try to work both Things, um, but these are uh, slides will be made available to you at the end of this. I'll get the link and throw it in the chat in case you want to review or click any of the links. Um, but I really like to think through this question of the true cost of misinformation because right now disinformation, disinformation research, disinformation as a, a trade craft, it is a very large industry and everybody's calling essentially whatever they do research on misinformation these days. And so uh, I'm going to try to hone in on some definitions that will help you kind of grasp onto where I'm coming from uh, so that you can understand a little bit more about our approach. So when we talk about media on my team, we talk about media as uh, very simple comms 101. It's an artifact of communication. It could be a textbook, could be a documentary, could be a meme, could be a web page, could be a, um, a papers from a meeting, could be the archive. Uh, media is a very broad definition for us. And media manipulation then means to change by artful or unfair means so as to serve one's purpose. So there's something going on with the relationship between media and the way in which people use it in the world, right? And we leave artful in there, of course, because we have activists and other kinds of folks that may use media manipulation in order to uh, cause confusion or alarm in order to bring attention to a situation. And I have an article in Scientific American about uh, this group called the Yes Men that were very good at using media manipulation to um, cause media attention on some very specific uh, uh, stories that they thought were uh, not going to be covered in the media. Particularly, they impersonated the World Trade Organization at one point um, and by, by essentially realizing that domains, you can buy them, anybody can get one. And so they bought the domain uh, closely associated with the World Trade Organization and then sort of impersonated them and, and was, were invited to several conferences to represent the World Trade Organization. Of course, when they showed up, the big reveal, of course, was that they weren't who they said they were. And they also did it to... Uh, they had a cloaked website that looked as if they were George W. Bush during the 90s uh, election. Remember the web in the 90s? It was Angel Fire, GeoCities, that was a thing. 
Um, so disinformation, though, is something that we hold out as a very particular definition. For us, it's a very high bar to call something disinformation. Um, when people throw the word around, it's a bit of a cringe fest in the field if you don't know what you're talking about. So for us, the creation and distribution of intentionally false information for political ends, that's what disinformation is. And so we actually need to be able to say we know where this came from and we know what the intent is or the intent had been revealed at some point in order to call something disinformation. Otherwise, we keep it in the realm of misinformation, which is information that is spread, but it is false. Uh, but we, we aren't able to maybe to tell the origins of it or we're not able to tell the, um, the intention of it. So uh, bear in mind, of course, there's no communication without misinformation. What we're not talking about is, hey, you know, someone's wrong on the internet. That's normal. Uh, what we're talking about here is a field is things that achieve such a massive amount of scale that it's beyond rumor, right? It's beyond gossip. It's something that is, uh, has this kind of socio-technical component to it where it has grown beyond um, uh, and, and quickly grown beyond um, any kind of echo chamber that may have contained that information and is, is now reaching out and, and, and breaking into new audiences. Uh, and we often think about social media as one network terrain in which misinformation at scale is achieved um, by using very specific sets of tactics. And I'll, and I'll outline a few of them today as I get to the case studies. But let's do some time setting. We are living in a pandemic. Uh, pandemic, of course, is Greek. Uh, it means all of the people, public and common, of disease. Um, it's widespread. Um, for me, the notion of the pandemic is really important right now because uh, we are all online. We are getting most of our information from the internet. That, for many scholars, is frightening. Um, there's a interesting article, uh, I think it was in, in the, it might have either been JAMA or the American uh, Journal of Public Health in the 90s from a doctor that's basically saying, uh-oh, like <laughs> if people go to the internet to get their health information, we're all in for a world of trouble. And so uh, when I'm thinking about this pandemic moment, I'm really thinking about, well, what are people's um, What's their access to timely, local, relevant, and accurate information? And how is disinformation actually, the presence of it itself, disrupting that? How is it displacing uh, our human right to truth? Um, and I highly recommend reading uh, Deirdre Mulligan's work on uh, rescripting search uh, to think through those issues related to uh, the right to truth. But I also know that we're living in a bit of pandemonium, uh, which is to say that it's a similar uh, route about um, uh, pan, <laughs> uh, but instead we're looking at an evil spirit, a divine power, um, a kind of an intentional moment in which chaos reigns. And so with the pandemic, of course, I feel like we're living through uh, pandemonium. And one of the reports that we wrote early on, which a lot of people were looking at Zoom bombing and were thinking, that's weird. Later, it, it was, that's racist. Um, and one of the things that we noted in our research on Zoom bombing is that we really wanted to mark a time and space where a lot of people, we're talking millions of people, were forced into a, a socio-technical arrangement, not of not designed in order to foster the kind of openness um, uh, that was needed in the moment. And as a result, Zoom was highly exploitable as a technology. Zoom was developed as a B2B, which means business to business. Uh, it didn't really have all the bells and whistles related to privacy built into it because it didn't anticipate uh, this kind of open forum it has a separate software, not the meeting one, but one related to the webinars that does have those kind of lock and key mechanisms. But by and large, you know, everybody's getting into these Zoom rooms and they're, you know, school boards are saying, yeah, teach on Zoom, you'll be fine. 
universities, go home teachers, just open up the Zoom and conduct class. And it was chaos. And it was chaos for two reasons. One is because the gates were not locked, but two, the users, many of them young folks, uh, decided that this was a moment for pranking. And so uh, classrooms would often get Zoom bombed where you know you would see uh, prior to a Zoom bombing, someone would be dropping a link into a, a chat room, a gamer chat room, or a, you know, a, a different uh, anonymous message board saying, hey, I got class at four. It would be funny if. And so Zoom bombing kind of comes out of this pranking moment. And then um, people start to coordinate. They start to, com they start to make these component pieces. So you have the chat room going, you have the links, you have the, you know, what the target is, uh, you know, you're going to disrupt a class, but then it's not enough to prank. Then it turns into, well, like we could actually, you know, show up and harass a bunch of, you know, LGBT folks who are holding a support group. We could show up and, and upset this uh, racial justice meeting. And so you start to see through coordination a kind of uh, networked racism and misogyny take hold. And so what we really tried to understand in this moment is how pandemonium actually can produce both rapid technological ad adaptation, but also uh, it required Zoom to then respond technologically quickly because Zoom as a business was going to sink if it couldn't get this moment right. And so they had to rapidly scale and they had to change a bunch of the user settings as well as introduce other security settings. And it wasn't necessarily just something that Zoom was tasked with. We saw numerous other research institutes and other cybersecurity outfits kind of jump in and poke holes in Zoom as much as they could. Uh, which then allowed that company to uh, try to shore up the the dam. But it was um, uh, a very strange moment in technology history because you don't necessarily often see that kind of rapid technological adoption unless so there's some kind of precipitating event. Uh, and so the pandemic kind of produced this massive adaptation and Thinking through that, I think we're also going through a similar thing related to uh, the Capitol insurrection, uh, as well as the um, uh, the the um, the well, most people just call it the big lie, but the the allegations that the vote uh, somehow was mishandled across several states, and that uh, Donald Trump was the true winner, that kind of disinformation campaign cannot happen without this kind of openness uh, and a lax uh, security structure uh, of platform companies, um, which essentially allow certain kinds of behaviors to manifest or not. So as we go through this, um, I would love to just kind of give you a little bit of theory. I mean, everybody, it's, it's Friday, it's the end of the day for me, a little bit of theory never hurt anybody. So I really love Chris Kelty's work. He's over at UCLA, he's a curmudgeon, he doesn't really tell people he publishes books, but uh, this book, it really inspired me, it's 2009, it's an ethnography of the free culture, uh, the free software uh, movement. Uh, and it's called Two Bits, The Cultural Significance of Free Software. And one of the things that he does in this book is he just kind of lays out how geeks see the world. And he says, geeks fashion together both technology, principally software, hardware, networks, and protocols, and imagination of the proper order of collective and political, collective political and commercial action that is of how economy and society should be ordered collectively. Right, so when someone's building technology, they're not necessarily thinking, oh, does this work? They're also thinking about, does this scale? Who does this help? How much money can I make? Can it make other people money that I could get a, a little piece of, right? It's like the, the Uber model, the Airbnb model. Can someone use this to make their money and I can just take a little bit? 
um, or a lot bit. <laughs> um, and so there's all these different ways in which we engage with technology. But of course, technology is the kind of thing that helps, you know, undergird and support foundationally uh, our communication structures, which then, um, you know, it builds up into our culture and our politics. And so the kinds of technology that we get in certain moments have a lot to do with the way in which our economy works and the way in which our um, po politics work, and then how geeks think this technology will fit in in a certain kind of way, whether it's to be disruptive, which we saw a lot of, you know, few, uh, maybe a decade ago, was, that was the buzzword, and now it's, you know, it's inclusive uh, as a buzzword. And um, I assure you, it is all in none of these things. Um, but you really have to get at, like, what is the technology? How is it being built? And how do they imagine, geeks imagine it changing the world? And so when I was thinking about this, when I was working at, uh, as the media manipulation lead over at Data and Society, I, was, I produced a report with Tony Nadler and Matt Crane about the digital influence machine. Really just taking a nuts and bolts look at the infrastructure that supports the internet, which the web is then built on top of, which then platforms uh, are also built on top of. And we wrote the digital influence machine is the infrastructure of data collection and targeting capacities developed by ad platforms, web publishers, inter other intermediaries, which includes consumer monitoring, audience targeting, and automated technologies that enhance its reach and ultimately its power to influence. It's really important that we understand this piece um, around the infrastructure. Uh, Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression, uh, also points out this, this fact, which is that many of the ways in which we engage with on information online are through advertising infrastructures. It's about selling us information. Uh, things that become popular then uh, often tend to be things that are free. And as a result, misinformation is really just able to uh, grow like, like moss on a stone uh, around the internet because it's often provided for free. Uh, but of course, the cost is to the rest of us. Uh, but it's important that we not be deluded into thinking that the web is anything much more at this point than a, an advertising technology that sometimes, you know, at timely, local, accurate, um, and relevant information scuttles around. But, it, you know, you really have to do a lot of digging these days to get at that higher quality information or you have to pay for it. What a tragedy, right? But we've seen subscription models, of course, pop up. We've seen apps um, that have a, a kind of buy-in model. Um, but by and large, uh, things that are free uh, on the internet, somebody else has paid for in some way, or uh, it's, it's targeting you for a very specific, either financial or... Um, political reason. And so who pays for social media, right? Uh, there's that adage, of course, if you pay for, uh, if you, it, you know, if the product is free, the product is you. And in talking with um, folks like Latanya Sweeney, you study um, anonymity and data and privacy on the, on the net, I've come to the conclusion that that's, that's an okay uh, way to think about it. But we should actually really expand to think about how data is only profitable or uh, worthwhile to pursue in the aggregate. My data is not that, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just not that valuable. Um, you know, it might be good evidence of a thing, I don't know, but for, by and large, uh, data is only profitable or valuable in the aggregate. That is when you have big buckets of different kinds of, of data to, to, to sell uh, and to make relational. And that's one of the things that social media does really well 
is all of the different signals that you send it by either posting or quick clicking or dwelling or sharing. Uh, all of those things are signals that can later be repackaged and sold and made into a consumer profile, federated with other information, linked up with your library card, <laughs> you know, all of these different things. Um, but I call your attention to two really important quotes from uh, uh, Zuckerberg, um, who, if you did know, is the founder of Facebook, um, although that's contested. Um, and he said in October 2019, I don't think it's right for a private company to censor politicians in a democracy. And I think most of us can get behind that sentiment. I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, I guess I could whisper free speech, First Amendment, uh, but I don't want the hellhounds of Harvard law to come descending from, uh, you know, from wherever they keep them up on Mass Ave. Um, you know, there's, there's free speech and that exists. And then there's marketing technologies that are leveraged to spread uh, disinformation at scale. Right. And those are two different things <laughs> to my mind, at least that's, that's what the research is starting to point us to. Um, so when he talks about censoring politicians in a democracy, we are in uh, quite a conundrum when it comes to thinking about it as a speech problem. And so my team has often tried to think about it as a problem of scale and a problem of amplification, which is to say, uh, where do you uh, put your speech? Uh, and then how is that speech spread? Um, and who is providing the mechanism by which that speech spreads? Is it you or is it some other entity? And I think those are important and open questions related to uh, speech online. Uh, but then they went on in January 2020 at Facebook to say this, in the absence of regulation, Facebook and other companies are left to design their own policies. We have based ours on the principle that people should be able to hear from those they who wish to lead them, warts and all. So who has warts? Well, there are trolls and apparently politicians, according to, to, um, to Facebook. But it's important that we hold on to a quote like this because later in, in the year, they start to walk it back a bit. They change some of the rules around advertising and targeting because they're starting to see that they are one very important lever in an entire digital influence machine where people that have money and power are using them in order to oppress the public, the people. Right, and so you don't want to be known as the technologist that dis that um, designed a machine that is really good at making sure people know how to how to like wh when and where to show up for a birthday party. So it's the same technology that gets you know uh, eight year olds together at the roller rink is the same technology then that is is used to spread um, voter fraud allegations to millions and millions and millions of people. And so it's really important that we understand that speech uh, in this case is different uh, for different classes of people, different kinds of people. And especially when you have um, money as one of the ways in which you can propel misinformation around the internet, like you have access to either buying advertising, which is sort of like the, the the cleanest form of disinformation in the sense that you're paying for um, the features of the platform to circulate it versus uh, a lot of the stuff that we study, which is either, you know, some SEO strategies, some, some uh, inauthentic, as Facebook would call it, inauthentic behavior that is paying for fake engagement or fake followers. Uh, or uh, in the case of a very, very popular people like President Trump, using your own networks to do that work. Uh, and so it's really important that we think about these things uh, holistically and we don't think about one platform or another, but we actually start to understand the entire ecosystem-wide problem that we are in related to disinformation at scale. 
And so we study this at uh, uh, the Shorenstein Center. Uh, you can read all of our uh, research up at mediamanipulation.org. Um, I have a very high commitment to open access uh, scholarship. And so we do um, publish, of course, peer reviewed papers and whatnot. But if I can get things out through um, other means, I will always try to make sure that we make it so that um, the, the best of our knowledge is available to journalists, policymakers, um, technologists, uh, public health officials. Uh, and, that's, and that's a really important uh, value that we have in our, on our research team. Uh, but when we study media manipulation, we look for five points of contact. We look at where is the media manipulation campaign being planned? That is, what is its origins? Very hard to find usually stage one though, um, and I'll explain why later. Stage two, we look at where it's being seeded across the platforms and the web. Stage three is actually where we find disinformation campaigns or media manipulation campaigns as they start to grow. That's when someone responds. So stage one and two, people can you know be tr try to make disinformation happen and fail. But uh, stage three, if someone responds or there's platform mitigation attempts, uh, a politician, a celebrity, uh, that kind of engagement is something that, you know, it kind of makes the, you know, like the meme says, it makes it go burr, like it really gets it moving. Stage four, mitigation, we look at what are the, for years, stage four was just journalists debunking things. Um, unfortunately, like we're in this predicament now where we don't have a lot of transparency around what it means to do mitigation, but there are a range of tactics that different um, either platforms or apps or email companies, domain registrars, uh, all up and down the tech stack that they can do to mitigate. And then lastly, we look at the adjustments by campaign, uh, by the media manipulators to the new information environments. Um, but if we can get all five stages, usually it means that it's disinformation. Uh, if we're missing stage one, we may classify it as a misinformation um, or a media manipulation campaign. But I'm going to go through a bit about that here. Um, I was part of this uh, misinformation, conspiracy theories, and infodemics uh, panel at the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence last, uh, last October, uh, yeah, October 15th. And one thing that was really important about this panel is that um, uh, finally we start to see Congress realizing that if you leave disinformation to fester, it'll eventually infect the whole product. And so at this point, Politicians are realizing that the if the effect on politics of disinformation isn't just cordon off to this, you know, foreign influence issue or spotting bots. That actually there's a huge domestic problem, and it's coming for them. And so, of course, now they're worried. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's really important that we address uh, that government is not a perfect lever for social change. Uh, we need activists, journalists, all kinds of other truth-telling institutions, including researchers involved. So it led me to give this testimony about who pays for misinformation. So I talked about misinformation as a problem akin to secondhand smoke. So, uh, you know, back in the day, people would smoke, other people would say, well, if you got sick, it's your own fault, it's your own choice, my right to smoke. Okay, cool. Uh, tobacco industry steps in, puts a bunch of money into research and says, uh, essentially, you know, um, uh, we blew this smoke on these plants and nothing happened. So there's no problem here. Uh, but it took epidemiologists and all kinds of different researchers to step in to say smoking, uh, secondhand smoke is a public health problem. And of course, that is a bit of a social construction, right? You have to actually invent secondhand smoke as a uh, phenomenon and then get all of your other institutions to rally around it and do the kind of work that they can do and as individual institutions uh, on different parts of the problem. So misinformation at scale is kind of our, our generation's secondhand smoke. 
And I argue that journalists, public health professionals, civil society leaders, public services, uh, amongst a whole range of other folks, pay the price uh, for misinformation at scale. And so we have several different case studies on our casebook that belabor the point. Uh, but first, let me talk a bit about journalists. There's a whole new beat of journalism that didn't exist in 2016 around disinformation. And this uh, disinformation beat is a huge drain on resources. A lot of journalists complain that they feel like they're glorified content moderators. And in the moments uh, around the first impeachment, there was this question of this whistleblower. And journalists knew his, uh, journalists on, in the right wing were promoting that the person uh, whose name it is, they were saying this person's name. They were saying, okay, we know who the whistleblower is. This is his name. The only uh, the comment, that the question that wasn't read during the first impeachment was actually Ron, uh, Rand Paul posing the question uh, using the name of the alleged whistleblower. But on the other side, center and left media know that whistleblowers uh, should re remain anonymous and that they shouldn't use the name of the whistleblower. And so there was a whole back and forth battle between uh, center left center and center left and left wing media and right wing media about this person's name. And eventually Twitter made that person's name unsearchable and untrendable because of all the different tactics that were being used, including keyword squatting and sw swarming, even um, uh, fake pictures were being uh, circulated. Actually, there were actually pictures of Alexander Soros hanging out with um, Clinton and, and a few other politicians. Uh, and then they were claiming that the, the image of that person was, you know, they weren't naming him as Alexander Soros. They were naming him as this whistleblower. And uh, because both men, Alexander Soros and the whistleblower were white guys with beards and, and glasses and no offense to white guys with beards and glasses, but people just thought they looked the same. And so uh, even the politician, Steve King retweeted this image claiming that this was the whistleblower when in fact it was uh, not. And so that kind of media manipulation campaign costs a lot of money and time and resources for journalists to have to unpack and, and kind of like really thread the needle uh, to, to make sense of. Public health professionals, of course, we know uh, are under attack. Many, uh, there's been a record number of uh, public health officials that have actually quit uh, since the pandemic started because of harassment. We just published this report on cloaked science about um, uh, Steve Bannon had flown a young woman um, who was a postdoc in Hong Kong, he, Steve Bannon flew her to the United States and then paid her to write this report that was then put up on Zenodo, which is a scientific archive. And it received nearly a million downloads. Uh, and she, as a, as a whistleblower was paraded around Fox News and a bunch of podcasts as this person who had discovered that COVID-19 was developed in a Chinese lab as a bioweapon. And so that's where the genesis of that um, medical disinformation campaign comes from. And so we call that tactic cloaked science. When you plant a science paper that um, gets thoroughly debunked, but you use it anyway as the pretense to say this other conspiracy theory. And of course, public health professionals have been battling numerous different conspiracy theories um, for a while now. As well, uh, there was a viral slogan. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. It keeps uh, coming back. It's got this mimetic quality to it where it returns uh, over and over. Uh, this slogan, it's okay to be white. I actually just saw a YouTube stream two nights ago that with the same title. Um, and some of the tactics that are used in a campaign like this uh, are really uh, insidious in the sense that what it asked, the original campaign uh, was launched on 4chan, which is an anonymous message board. 
And it was a, a call to action that said, go to your college campus or someplace in your town and put up flyers that only say it's okay to be white. It doesn't say anything else. Uh, no organization, no call to action. And then, you know, people like me, you know, some of the liberal professors, other students, uh, people in the town would take a picture of it and say, oh my God, there are racists in my town. And the point of the operation, the influence operation, were, was to get that exact thing to happen so that I become the source of information because I took the picture and I said, oh, this is outrageous. And then my social media becomes this place where these trolls kind of will step in and say, well, why do you think it says, you know, why do you think it's not okay to be white? You're crazy, right? And it's about setting media agendas. They did this so much in 2017 that there were over 140 college newspapers that reported on it's okay to be white on their college campus. Um, and in Massachusetts, someone made a huge banner and put it up over the highway saying it's okay to be white and we're able to get on the local news. And so civil society becomes the folks that got to fight back against this. You got to figure out what what's happening, where it's happening. And then um, civil society and racial justice organizations are the ones tasked with uh, healing uh, the community or raising awareness or community safety. And uh, it's a really unfortunate thing that we see happen over and over and over again, because it's about kind of moving the wires and the weeds together in a way that causes public alarm and then conversation about white identity politics. And then lastly, we have this new case study that um, me and Nicole Lever wrote about uh, Hammer and Scorecard. So this is another case study about um, Steve Bannon, who uh, was it? He was sort of like um, really at the at the forefront of the uh, claim that the Dominion uh, voting machines had been hacked and that the algorithms had been the communist algorithms had been flipped. Uh, Hammer and Scorecard were the name of the computing system, the supercomputer, and the uh, Scorecard was the name of the the algorithm and the algorithm had gone haywire. It was supposed to just change the votes a little, but instead it changed the votes too much, yada, yada, yada. And, um, but the genesis of this hashtag hammer and scorecard is supposed to make you think of hammer and sickle. Uh, so if you made that inference, you're not wrong. And it uses a whole slew of tactics like keyword squatting. That is it, it wanted people to, Anytime you looked up voter fraud or hammer and scorecard, it wanted you to find their information. It used distributed amplification. There was a lot of claims that everybody needed to talk about this on their social media because they, the platforms, were going to take it down. And of course, it used viral sloganeering, which we see as a as a consistent element in which uh, mass um, mass cam mass. Uh, uh, disinformation campaigns play out. Uh, of course, it was this was a, a feature uh, part of the Stop the Steal campaign that uh, kind of enveloped all of us. And I hope to be producing a, a different case study on that in the future. So I just want to close by saying, like secondhand smoke, misinformation damages the quality of public life. Every conspiracy theory, every propaganda disinformation campaign affects people. And the expense of not responding can grow exponentially over time. Since the 2016 US election, newsrooms, tech companies, civil society orgs, politicians, educators, and researchers have been working to quarantine the viral spread of misinformation. The true costs have been passed on to, to rely on social media to get news and information. And not to be such a bummer because like it's Friday and we're gonna go into the weekend and some of us like don't like to feel like it's all terrible. I have a few things I think we can chew on as a field um, in order to try to get uh, some kind of guardrail system uh, in place to not allow this to happen anymore. So I have some ideas around content curation where I, you know, I, I say hire 10,000 librarians. I actually think it could work if we really did deploy a workforce to do content curation in a way that was mindful 
Um, coupled with transparency and content moderation, the January 6th proved that the internet is a crime scene and platform companies taking stuff down is not enough. They actually have to create a human rights locker for that information. Uh, and I know that there are people at, at Cal working on that and very grateful for the work that people do. Uh, and we need a distribution plan for the truth. Like when I say truth, I mean timely, local, relevant, accurate information that also supports public media. And then we should develop a policy on strategic amplification that mirrors the public interest obligations of other broadcast companies. Why is it we have timelines and news feeds and no Every once in a while, people got to learn a little bit about what's going on in their town. Uh, we make radio stations do this. Uh, why don't we make social media companies provide some of that information? And then lastly, technology companies, including large infrastructure services, must fund independent civil rights audits where auditors are able to access the data needed to perform investigations, including rec a record of decisions to remove, monetize, and amplify content. I see this as crucial in this moment where uh, human rights violations are happening uh, and these platform companies are treating their uh, power level as one that is, uh, you know, frankly, too big to legislate. And so when you uh, get companies that are too big to legislate, as we're seeing play out in Australia, uh, and are turning down, actually dialing down the accessibility of news, uh, we have to wonder then what kind of massive public harms is that causing. So I thank you everybody for your time and uh, look forward to, unfortunately, only a few questions, but uh, I'll come back. It was easy. I only had to be at my house, so it's good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joan. That was really wonderful. And you can see actually in the Q&A that, uh, you know, and the people are liking it too. So Sarah says, you know, fabulous information clearly presented and I completely agree. This was wonderful. So I, uh, I would actually uh, like to, um, you know, to begin with the third question, because, you know, your, your last slides were, was, you know, giving us a little bit of hope. Um, but then uh, on some level, uh, you know, some of the transformations of this sort of public sphere today are, 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 are moving through the sort of these new channels. So I'll just read the question the way it was worded, because it's very similar to the idea that I, and, you know, to the way I, I wanted to conceptualize it myself. Um, are there observable differences, for instance, in scale between the effects uh, of misinformation spread via messaging services, such as WhatsApp, and other large audience social media. So what mitigation strategies are effective against misinformation spread via messaging services? Because a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, this is going through, uh, you know, in a, in a much more covered manner. So when I think about uh, messaging services, I'm mostly thinking about Telegram uh, in this moment because of the way in which uh, different groups over the years, especially white supremacists, uh, as they get removed from YouTube, uh, started to go over to Telegram. And there's just different coordinating capacities. The, the, the reason why we see so much misinformation on Facebook has to do with the group features. And these groups can grow very, very large and um, are almost like radio stations in and of themselves, right? They circulate a massive amount of information to a bunch of people without any kind of accountability about if it's true or false or dangerous. Um, I'm thinking here, you know, um, at Harvard, we're always required to slam Stanford. <laughs> so, uh, but if you remember back to the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a, a kind of chain letter being circulated through SMS saying that Stanford researchers had found that if you drink a little bit of water every 15 minutes, uh, you're not gonna get COVID. And if you hold your breath, you can actually test yourself. Uh, and the reason why it was attributed to Stanford is because it added that aura of authenticity and the legitimacy, although I don't know why they didn't say it came from Harvard. Um, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Well, we can all joke about Stanford, right? Um, but I, I point that out to say that reached a massive amount of people and we still don't know how it happened. It was like a screenshot that was being shared 
But Arena Pesquero has um, a piece about uh, messaging apps that really just kind of resonated with me. And I think there's a lot more research to do, which is that people were participating in just in case sharing. That is just in case you didn't get this information. And for the most part, just in case sharing is probably fairly innocuous, except in the case where you get a just in case share that says uh, masks cause bacterial pneumonia. And that to me is a big problem, right? Uh, because that's not true. And so we don't know the degree to which yet these different kinds of messaging apps or small group apps are um, exploitable or harness the capacity to do misinformation at scale or are something that should be dealt with more like you would deal with local rumors and hoaxes uh, that only touch a, uh, a few hundred or maybe even a few thousand people. A lot of the stuff we look at has reached millions by many different means. Yeah. So we have a lot of questions, you know, they keep coming up. Uh, so um, maybe we will, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll ask just one, which is the second one, uh, which is about Zoom bombing. Um, there seems to be a, you know, a, a, Avi, the person who's asking the question, uh, seems to be uh, uh, objecting a little bit to your portrayal. So he says, um, when the Zoom bombing got rolling, what uh, was it happening across a broad swath of the culture? I mean, were church services and boys could meetings being interrupted too? Or was it really more of an excuse for gamer boys to get away with spreading their juvenile misogyny and various phobia? Phobias. Uh, your portrayal seems to let it up easy that it was just pranking by gamers. So how would you? Uh, so yeah, if you look in the report, uh, um, and I and I apologize if that's how the portrayal came off. It's it starts with pranking, and this is sort of how a lot of these things do start, which is juvenile, and of course, uh, that doesn't let anybody off the hook for being you know damaging uh, or threatening or harassing. But uh, what I meant by the story was to say that it eventually took on a kind of culture and it turned into networked harassments uh, where we were seeing people from all different kinds of strata participating, not just gamer folks. Although the documentation online kind of skews that way because you have people who really just wanna get people to watch their YouTube videos or their, uh, their TikToks and so they're videotaping themselves, her, you know, videotaping, dated. Uh, they're recording themselves um, doing these kinds of pranks. And so that's the kind of information that we were privy to. And then we worked with some journalists to talk to victims of a Zoom bombing there. And, and it did run the gamut. I, it went from everyone from Alcoholics Anonymous groups, anyone that posted online, essentially, we're going to have a Zoom uh, would, you know, fall prey to some of these Zoom bombers. You know, I'm, there were reports of children's story time uh, where people were reading books to kids uh, that got Zoom bombed. And so, uh, but when it takes on this character of network, um, network coordination, that's because the technology itself has failed to see that it is part of an ecosystem of communication technologies and that none of this stands alone. There's no app, there's no website, there's none of it stands outside of all of the other things. And so you actually have to think about, well, my technology with this other technology provides what new capability? Um, and so thank you for asking me to clarify and, and to go deeper on that. Okay, so it's technically 12.59, but I'll ask one last question if you can answer quickly. Um, and there's so many wonderful questions, but here's uh, Jamie here. Uh, what you presented is exemplary and sorely needed, except for Australia, you made little mention of the rest of the world. However, the worldwide impact is at least as bad, if not worse. Are you aware of any work going on at the international governance level to address the issues that you discussed? Yeah, so uh, if not for the long title, it would have been called the Global Media Manipulation Casebook. And so we're just getting started. It took us about a year and a half to get the infrastructure and the code book and the pre-research 
uh, sorted out. And now we are really excited to say that we're going to be hosting a bunch of casebook trainings and helping people see through the theory methods model. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully going to be sourcing a whole bunch of different case studies from graduate students or professors that want to, or reporters or civil society folks that want to write a case study. And so we have a couple of different case studies in there, a uh, couple from India, one, one very, very interesting one from Egypt. Um, and so our hope is actually to make this a place where we can build um, a kind of collaborative ethnographic space where different researchers are able to give a little bit of knowledge uh, into this, uh, you know, kind of collective textbook or, you know, resource. And then over time, we're hoping that as we expand, um, we can expand into other languages. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, I work at Harvard, but it's a lot like, you know, any other kind of research institute where we're really just limited by the funding. Um, and so as we uh, think about uh, how to expand this and, and where, where else we partner, very excited to talk to other people at different universities about how we partner together and, and how we um, make this work useful for those who are kind of stuck in this moment where tech companies are fighting for legitimacy against governments who are using the technology against the people and how civil society is just like, you know, punching up constantly. Uh, but for us as a research team, the goal here is to make sure that um, information is uh, accessible and that accurate information is uh, not withheld uh, in, any, in any way, shape, or form, uh, especially in moments when it's life and death, especially in moments when you need to make decisions about your politics and your livelihood. And so we see this as a, as a sort of our research intervention into the broader conversation on um, the power of these huge, huge institutions uh, who are all kind of fighting for legitimacy amongst one another. And so um we're going to get there. Uh, I don't, you know, for me, it's like, this is the career. Uh, this is the career path I want to be on uh, in terms of like doing research that matters to, to as many people that want to participate in it that we can accommodate. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your accurate uh, information <laughs> with us today and and I also want to thank uh, the audience here for asking the, all of these uh, wonderful questions which unfortunately we did not get to ask uh, but uh, Joan will have a record of it uh, and uh, you know maybe you can communicate separately and and you you promised uh, the um, oh the slides the slides yeah. so if you could just send them in the chat uh, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, we can also post them on our website. So um, once the video is, is made available, we will ha also just have to make them slides. view only so that you don't get in there and mess them up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, panelists and attendees. Okay, that's on its way. There you go. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, well, we look forward to uh, many more uh, such uh, conversations in the future. We're we'll certainly very excited to have had you here today at Berkeley. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.